Yeah, that's the right one. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for coming. This is the second installment of the philosophy seminar at the um, UQ this year. And for this second installment, we have the pleasure of having Professor Ed Maris from the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand, who is um, a logician and, uh, well, in general, a theoretical philosopher to put it somehow, no, to <laughs> speak broadly uh, about this area. And he has uh, various books and, of course, many articles. And recently, he has uh, a book out, um, if I understand correctly, Ed. So this talk will be based on your new book. It's it's connected with it. Perfect, yeah. So, and he's going to be talking about one of his own uh, interests, which is uh, entailment and other conditionals. So please, please uh, take the floor. It's all yours. Yeah, hi. Uh, uh, thanks, Guillermo. Thanks for inviting me. Um, uh, and it's it's nice to see so many old friends and um, uh, among participants uh, 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 in the, the, I guess, the audio, the virtual audience. Um, okay, so as, oh dear, uh, as Guy just said, um, this is connected with uh, my new book, uh, The Logic of Entailment and Its History. I say connected with it because it's not really out of the book. But anyway, I'll, I'll just mention that the book was published two weeks ago. Uh, uh, that just came out with Cambridge. And I hope your um, uh, university library ha will have access to it, at least electronically, uh, in the near future. And one of the things I'm proudest about here, I'm going to Skype for a second, is that I, I, uh, uh, the, the, the cover photo was, it was a, a picture I took, you know, so that's... Oh. Uh, that was one of my um, uh, uh, first uh, sort of published photos, uh, that one. And uh, uh, let's say one of them, because was, I had one come out uh, uh, almost exactly the same time elsewhere. But that, um, uh, anyway, so that's, that, that's a different sort of publication. But uh, in that book, in the first half of that book, I um, uh, 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 discuss various... Uh, uh, 20th century, I don't go back beyond the, before the 20th century, uh, at, at attempts to formalize the logic of entailment, and I'll talk about what that means in a couple of minutes. Um, but there was one sort of gap in that, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in, in my history there, and this uh, talk is to fill that gap. Uh, the gap has to do with this guy, uh, Paul Grice. Now, uh, in, uh, I'll go back to that. Uh, it, 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 this is based on, uh, um, on yeah, you'll know, get that, uh, um, on a paper he gave in a panel discussion in December 1971 at the American Philosophical Association. The other participants, Dana Scott uh, and Bob Meyer, uh, published uh, their um, uh, uh, contributions to that panel in uh, the Journal of Philosophy. They were published before the, uh, the, 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 the APA meeting. I found that kind of interesting. But anyway, the, um, uh, Scott's paper in particular has become a classic, and I think, and one of the chapters in my book is actually dedicated in, uh, almost entirely to uh, Scott's program in his paper on engendering an illusion of understanding. Uh, Bob Meyer's paper is interesting partly because uh, it's uh, uh, almost everything he says in there is based on a conjecture he made that turned out to be later to be false. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting uh, thing, but uh, it's still quite a well-known paper and quite an interesting one. Grice's paper was called The Deductive Paradoxes, at least in manuscript form, but it was never published. He never finished it. And um, there's one of the uh, uh, pages of the manuscript. And I wondered what Grice had said, and I kind of hoped he'd say something like the, the view that um, I will talk about right at the end uh, uh, that was more like his theory of um, uh, indicative conditionals, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later on. Um, 
But at any rate, I asked, uh, I, I worked um, extensively with Meyer back in the um, er, uh, late 80s and early 90s, and I'd asked him what Bryce had said, and he couldn't remember. Uh, I had a friend, um, Alistair Urquhart, who'd been at the, uh, that uh, the session, and he remembered all sorts of things about uh, the way Grice was dressed, but he couldn't remember <laughs> what he said. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. So I, I, I had, didn't have any clue, but um, it didn't occur to me to go look, go to Berkeley and go to the uh, archives, Berkeley, where he taught, uh, and uh, see if they had his manuscript. And they did. They actually have two versions of the manuscript there. They stop, uh, but the manuscript was never finished. Uh, both of the um, uh, of the uh, uh, drafts of the manuscript stop at about the same place. And he seems to have run into a, a particular problem. And I'll talk about what that problem is because it's quite clear what the problem is. Because uh, um, it basically tells us what the problem is. Uh, but you see the the, 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 the the view kind of grinding to a halt in both of them in slightly different ways, but, but basically because he couldn't solve that one problem. Uh, I'll suggest a way of getting around the problem, but by modifying his view rather extensively in some ways. Okay, so that's the sort of project, and it's to fill a kind of gap in, in, in my book. I, I, I think there was something a little bit missing there, and that is this sort of Gricean pragmatic uh, approach to entailment, which isn't discussed at all in my book, but I think is kind of an interesting uh, view. Okay, well, what is entailment? Well, G. Moore back in uh, 1919 um, 19, uh, defined it as uh, the converse of deducibility. And what that means is that if suppose you have uh, uh, um, an, uh, an argument A, therefore B, uh, then A entails B. So uh, if B is deducible from A, this is what the converse is, then A entails B. Okay. Okay, now there's two notions of entailment that you find in the literature. Uh, there's one that's entailment as a relation. It's just a name for the deducibility relation between sentences, and sometimes um, uh, Moore will talk about it as a relation. Uh, and same thing with C.I. Lewis, who really was talking about entailment, though he called it the um, uh, implication uh, uh, from uh, 1912 onwards. Um, or in, or it's, it's a, a, a relation between sets of premises and a conclusion. Uh, or uh, entailment can be taken as a connective. Uh, and which I think was what Book Moore really wanted to talk about. Well, he does talk about it as a connective. So it's a propositional connective like conjunction or material implication and can be iterated in the formula. Okay, so in one of Grice's manuscripts, he treats entailment as a connective, but in the other, he really treats it as a relation. Uh, which manuscript comes first and which one has priority? I have no idea. He doesn't really say. They're in two different folders in the uh, in his uh, in the box of, of papers, and you know, uh, 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 I'm um, it doesn't really matter for this talk. Uh, but I just want to say a, a, a few things because my book is about in uh, logics that take entailment as a connective because I think that's a lot more interesting. Well, why would you, you have it as a connective and why do you want iterated uh, 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 entailments in, a, in, in, in a, a, a particular statement? Well, that's to, to formulate um, uh, proof plans, uh, plans of, uh, 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 of doing a deduction. So if you say to yourself, I, uh, if I prove that A entails B and B entails C, then I'll, a proof of A will yield a proof of C. And that can be just formulated in the way uh, given here on this slide as um, a form of transitivity of uh, entailment. So here the arrow is taken to be entailment. This won't, the arrow won't show up uh, um, uh, again, I think, in, the, um, in my talk. Um, but uh, that's just to, to tell you what my book is about rather than uh, 
Um, so for the connective, I use uh, uh, the arrow and for the relation between premises and conclusion, uh, I, I use this little turnstile. It's a fairly standard way of doing it and uh, Grice uses the turnstile as well. Okay. Now, what does Grice want to get uh, want to do, right? So he takes this kind of a default position that uh, entailment is represented by a modal logic like um, S5. So in which uh, uh, an entailment's true if in every world in which the premises are true, the inclusion's also true. Okay. And then he, he wants to modify that. Or um, uh, in other places, he just talks about it in, in terms of classical logic. That's the classical uh, um, uh, 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 relationship. And um, which is very similar if you, if, you, if you don't include modal operators and he doesn't most of the time. He does a little bit in one of the manuscripts, but that doesn't matter. And I'm going to talk about that because he doesn't really do anything with them. Uh, okay. So he wants to avoid the paradoxes of entailment. Uh, and he considers two of them. Well, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll modify that slightly in a minute. But one of them is uh, uh, known as explosion or expo uh, uh, false of what the bit. Uh, in which anything follows from a contradiction. That one he doesn't consider that important, right? He's not that concerned with um, uh, uh, the paraconsistent project as we now know it. He's read Bob Meyer's uh, uh, paper. Meyer uh, apparently had sent it to him already. Uh, and he comments on that. And he says, he, and he says, well, look, mathematicians if they're thinking about what follows from what, if they follow, if they find that there's a contradiction in the theory they have, what they do is they change the theory. And so he says he doesn't really consider that that important. What he does consider important is the second one, uh, which doesn't have any accepted name. I think in the in the book I call it implosion, but um, uh, uh, just for sake of duality, that where anything entails a tautology. Now, that he thinks is important because in terms of talking about a real connection between uh, statements, that, that sort of violates this, right? Because when we talk about entailments, we often talk about, uh, in things we're trying to prove, we often talk about trying to get to tautologies. And you want a real way of getting to it rather than just saying, oh, when you realize something's a tautology, we could have got there anyway by any set of premises. And so he doesn't think that, uh, he thinks that that's important to deal with. But he does want to deal with both of them. He does try to deal with both of them. Uh, but as I say, his emphasis is on the second. Okay, so he gives us a framework to deal with, and this is his terminology, not mine. So we can blame Grice for this. Uh, an inference A entails B is called a Y schema. Y is for yields. So he talks about ordinary inference and uh, classical inference as yielding. That's the, so uh, A yields B, um, uh, if and only if it's an inference, uh, a valid inference in classical logic. Okay. So now if we have a Y schema, yielding schema, we call it contingently applicable if and only if neither A nor B are tautologies or contradictions. That is that they're both contingent formulas. And it's fully contingently applicable uh, if and only if uh, there's no subformula of either A or B that's either a tautology or contradiction. Okay, so I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so a true entailment is a substitution instance of a fully contingently applicable Y schema. Okay, that's a mouthful and a lot to remember, so I'll go through that. Okay, so A implies B or not B is a Y schema, but not contingently applicable because the conclusion is a tautology. Okay. A, imply, A entails A and B 
be or not be is contingently applicable, but it's not fully contingently applicable. Why? Because the be or not be there is a tautology, and it's a subformula of the conclusion. Okay. Now, what's a substitution instance? Well, the inference uh, A ent uh, entails A or B is an FCA. It's a, one of these good Y schemas. And you have as a substitution instances P entails P or P and Q, or uh, Q and R. And that is um, uh, the, the, everything there is contingent, the P and all of the, and the P or Q and R and all of the subformulas. That's uh, 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 contingent. Uh, and but so is but three is uh, also a substitution instance because you replace B with Q or not Q. Well, that's not contingent, it's a tautology, but that's okay, right? Because it's an instance of a reasoning process or a reasoning uh, rule that is itself okay, right? It's I. Uh, so the, the 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 reasoning behind it is okay. Now he doesn't want to eliminate uh, um, tautologies as conclusions, in particular. Why not? Because a lot of our entailments are to get tautologies, right? A proof plan, in in my sense, is something that's trying to get us to a theorem, to something that's. Uh, and in classical uh, or in, in in propositional logic, in classical propositional logic, that's a tautology. All right, so you don't want to eliminate those. Okay. Now you're gonna have to. Uh, someone's gonna have to tell me when I'm running out of time. By the way, uh, so there's some nice things about this, and one of the nice things about this is that we can uh, can can use a well-known theorem of, about classical logic called the interpolation theorem. Uh, so if A entails B, and A is not a contradiction, and B is not a tautology, then there's some formula C that is the interpolant between them, so that A entails C and C entails B, but C only contains the vocabulary that is common to A and B. Well, that's really nice. Because that tells us that, um, well, anyway, uh, the, uh, I think I'll probably skip the uh, the, the the example uh, for that. But that's uh, um, really nice because this tells us, right? C has got to be in the common vocabulary, so there has to be a common vocabulary. And we get a property out of this called variable sharing, which means A and B have to have some uh, propositional variable like P, Q, or R in common. They have to have this non-logical vocabulary in common. So there's a sense in which we stay on topic. And this is a, a property that relevant logicians uh, have Want well, not have wanted for their logic, but uh, just wanted, but said that is a necessary condition for being considered a relevant logic. So, the notion of entailment he has is at least quasi relevant. It's got this property for it, uh, to it. Okay, so that's quite nice. Okay, I'm going to skip the uh, the example of this because uh, last time I gave this talk, I ran out of time. And um, I, okay, so the, 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 the class of Gricean entailments have the variable sharing property. Uh, and they, the, the, there's this idea of staying on the same topic, at least to some extent, right? Because there can be extraneous information in A and B that isn't, that isn't connected with, it, the, with, with the other. Okay. Now here's a problem. This is um, C from C.I. Lewis. It's a famous uh, argument. He calls it his uh, independent argument. 
for uh, X falso, above the bit for, for explosion. So we start with a hypothesis, P and not P. Okay, from that we get P. From that we get P or Q by adding a disjunction with introduction. Uh, from one, we can then get not P as well because it's conjunction elimination, right? And from three and four by disjunctive syllogism, we get Q. Okay, so um, Grace is aware of this argument. Of course, it's a famous argument. He doesn't mention this one particular, but he does talk about arguments like this. Uh, and he says, so what, what's going on here? Because each step between one and two, two and three, three and four, and four and five, each step can be formalized as an FCA in, uh, entailment, uh, fully contingently applicable uh, 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 Y schema. It, it, they're, they're all uh, instances of that. So each step is kosher, so to speak. Uh, um, it's allowable. So why isn't the argument allowable and hence ex falso allowable? Uh, well, what does he reject? What he rejects is the transitivity of entailment, right? So you don't, so one doesn't entail five because uh, just because you have e for each step uh, an entailment doesn't mean the whole thing is an entailment. Okay, and so the way we can we could formalize it more formally uh, is uh, at least some of the steps here um, that p and not p implies p or q and not p and uh, p and uh, p or q and not p uh, uh, implies q it entails q. Uh, he agrees with all of that. Um, and then by transitivity, uh, or what we would call in proof theory, uh, the cut print, uh, rule, um, we get P and not P entails Q. And that's what he's rejecting. He says that rule doesn't preserve entailments. Okay, he doesn't like that, but he's willing to buy it. You know, little as you know, now there are all of these uh, 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 philosophers like um, Australia's own Dave Ripley uh, who reject transitivity in the, 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 the school at, um, uh, of, uh, of logicians at Buenos Aires and so on, who, uh, and, oh, and um, Neil Tennant, of course, uh, who reject uh, transitivity of entailment. Uh, um, and actually, even before uh, uh, Grice, there was a, a Smiley had argued uh, for the rejection of the transitivity of entailment for exactly this reason. Um, but he quite he worries about it. This is where he's, he's you can see him start to get kind of cold feet at this point. So he says, if we adopt this definition, we shall deprive entailment of the property of transitivity since there's no guarantee that a step from the first term to the last term of any in, in individually acceptable entailment sentence can be licensed by a fully contingently applicable Y scheme. Okay, so that's, and while the renunciation of transitivity may well not be disastrous, it should not be, it should not presumably be lightly entered upon. Okay, so he's getting slightly cold feet, but you can see he's willing to go for it. He's willing to accept uh, the violation of transitivity, that's not the real problem. But he starts to get real cold feet when he sees that his uh, certain things sneak through his, um, his definitions. Okay, so uh, what in particular? So he wants to bar P uh, entails P and Q or not Q as a, uh, so <clears throat> P entails P and tautology, right? That is uh, a Y schema, or uh, it's an instance of a Y schema anyway. Uh, and 
Um, but it's not full, a fully contingent wire schema, fully contingently acceptable wire schema. Why? Because this is a the Q or not Q. I hope you can see my cursor moving around. Uh, is not um, a, it is a tautology. It's not contingent. Okay, but he realizes he still gets this right. Where you take the first one, this thing that's not acceptable, and you distribute P uh, across the disjunction, you get P in, uh, uh, entails P and Q or P and not Q, which he thinks is just as bad because you've got that Q or not Q in there, but in a sneaky way. There is no subformula here that's a tautology but the tautology is there and you can see that it's there because it's a tautology, right? That, um, uh, but he's, I think he's wrong about this. So it, this is the point where he gives up. He see what he sees is that at this point that if he's going to continue along these lines, he's going to have to make his definitions much more complicated. And I don't think he was, uh, well, it, it, I, he wasn't really willing to do this. So the, the manuscripts really um, uh, become at that point very sketchy, bunch of uh, jotting of notes and attempts at derivations. And maybe there were more definitions in there. It's very hard to, to see them as that, but they're really just scratch notes at that, at that stage. So things fall apart here. Okay, but I think that there there is a sense in which he's wrong about that. That this this thing isn't as that the one on top is worse than the one on the bottom, even though they are equivalent. Okay, so there is actually another problem here uh, that I would like to mention. It is the case that, and I've got a little argument here, but I'm. I, uh, uh, um, uh, I'll, I'll truncate it. Uh, uh, it uh, so the problem is that the class of FCA uh, Y schemas is not computably enumerable. Well, why is that a problem? Well, it means you can't axiomatize the, uh, the, 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 the set of Y schemas that this is based on. Okay. This isn't strictly speaking, what I've just said isn't strictly speaking true. What we have to do is imagine what this would be uh, trans, uh, it, it, instead of being about classical propositional logic, but perhaps proposi uh, but classical quantificational logic, first order classification. Why? Well, because first order uh, uh, logic is not decidable. And if you could represent all of the FCA um, uh, 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 y schemas, you could um, uh, then um, uh, uh, axiomatize the class of non uh, of non tautology. Uh, uh, sorry, of non theorems of first order classical logic. And if you can axiomatize the class of, 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 of uh, theorems, which we can do, and the class of non theorems, then you could produce a, a, a um, uh, a, uh, um, a decision procedure, but we know there isn't one. Okay, so that's a little bit of a problem that lies beneath the surface here, is this, uh, uh, the fact that it's not, uh, uh, that the, the, the class of, of, um, uh, of uh, 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 schemas isn't um, uh, uh, axiomatizable. Is that a real problem? It's not so clear that um, the class of substitution instances isn't uh, um, uh, axiomatizable. It doesn't follow from that, at least in, I can't see how it follows. Maybe it does, but I, I, I can't see it. Um, but look, this is something we, you start with a basic idea, which is classical validity. 
and then you start playing with it, right? The, the, that's the basic idea. Then there's there are the, the, a class of classically valid um, uh, inferences that we're interested in. If you can't determine what those are, if there's no way of determining them, how useful is this notion of uh, uh, of validity for what Grace wants it to be used for, uh, which is to say, well, look, right? I mean, and you might say, well, um, you know, can't should we say that about all other non-exercisable logics like second order logic? Well, some people have said that about full second order logic, but at least we have a way of determining it that's not quite so vague, which is the, 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 there's a class of fairly, in, in some way, intelligible class of models for full, full second order logic. We kind of understand what that is. We have a way into it. Whereas this, I think, is a bit, uh, is a bit more difficult. Um, but, but, okay, that's a worry. It's not a it's not a, a refutation and you, it's a worry. And you might say well, it's 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 no more of a worry here than it is for full second order logic. And that might be true. I, I'm, I'm not sure. OK, well, how should we fix the view up? Well, <clears throat> Grice holds that. Um, uh, that um, indicative conditionals uh are really material conditionals and this is actually his example I, I like that if australia wins the first test it'll win the ashes uh kind of appropriate for the um uh audience i have today um but in stating conditional one also usually makes a conversational implicature that there's some real connection between antecedent and consequent and Grice leaves it quite vague what that real connection could be. Frank Jackson and uh, uh, David Lewis, in fact, sort of supplemented uh, Grice's view. And really, that's Frank's uh, 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 um, contribution, I think, that, uh, with the claim that uh, conditionals come with conventional implicatures as well. So that means that attached to the meaning of if-then in English, is uh, an idea that there has to be um, uh, that there has to be something else, and for 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 Jackson, that is that there has to be a high probability uh, that um, uh, the consequent will be true given the antecedent. Uh, but I'll set aside the actual um, details of that, because that doesn't really matter so much. But what does matter is that maybe we could treat entailment, the notion of entailment, as, um, or, or at least the, 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 the phrase entailment, as something similar to the way in which we treat other conditionals. And this is the, the view I kind of wanted for my... Um, uh, for my book, and probably I should have invented for myself, given that I didn't have the manuscript, and uh, um, it's not really in there, although I'll show you a quotation in a minute. Uh, um, say that the, um, the the truth condition for the entailments is just the corresponding Y schema, that the, the, the conditional, uh, that the classical validity uh, holds, that the, 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 um, the argument that we're giving, the, the entailment, is classically valid, but the assertion of a, 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 a assertion condition for entailment is that there is an FCA schema that underlies the entailment. Okay, why is that better? Um, I uh, why is sorry, I uh, well why is that a better idea? Well. The idea here is that um, we don't have to really care about decidability and so on, unless, it, it, as um, we can give it as a, uh, uh, you know, if if someone is to assert that something is an entailment rather than just it follows that classically or something like that, 
say, making a weaker claim, then they have to back, they, ha they, they should have to back it up, the claim that there is this way of deriving at this uh, FCA Y schema uh, that underlies it, right? It isn't the case that we need an axiomatization of the system. Uh, it's just something we can appeal to on particular cases. You say, it doesn't just follow from it, it's an entailment. And that adds a certain emphasis. And it, it does seem like the sort of thing that would be uh, a benefit in the same way that uh, uh, if you say, well, uh, if then you say, well, look, okay, the material conditional holds. I could just say, uh, uh, Australia wins the first test. Material implies that it wins the it will win the Ashes, uh, and that's a weaker thing because that would be true if Australia just failed to win the first test, right? Uh, but it's stronger if I, if I say the if then because I imply, or at least there's an implicature, the conversational uh, implication, as he sometimes calls it, uh, uh, holds that there is a real connection, and the same thing. I think could be true, uh, the, the, the pragmatically for uh, the entailments. Okay, let's go on. Um, what sort of argument uh, 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 can we give this? Well, for the uh, Grice gives this argument uh, uh, for uh, what he calls the direct argument uh, for. Um, uh, or I think maybe uh, 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 Stalnager called it the direct argument. But at any rate, either Sally is not in Wellington or she's attending a lecture. That's a premise. And as a conclusion, if Sally is in Wellington, um, she's attending a lecture. Well, that seems like a, a, a good argument to people. Uh, and Grice's are, as, uh, Grice claims that the simplest explanation for why this argument holds is that the um, uh, conditional really is, in the sense of its truth condition, the material implication. Um, okay, I'll, I'll skip why. Uh, uh, um, uh, but we could give a similar argument, a direct argument, I think, here for entailment. Um, and that says, well, suppose we can prove that either P or Q holds of a class of mathematical structures. Uh, then a mathematician seem willing to say that not P entails Q. The simplest explanation for this inference from provability of disjunction of the, uh, uh, from the provability of a disjunction to the entailment is that the truth condition of, for entailment is just the provability of the disjunction. Okay so that um, the provability of A or B is equivalent to um, not A entails B, right? Uh, and that holds in the classical case, so that the uh, having the truth condition as the Y schema seems to be uh, explanatory in the same way that uh, the, um, uh, the, the, that the material conditional seems to be explanatory for, um, uh, uh, for the um, indicative conditional. Uh, okay, now here I would just end off. I wanna uh, uh, say that Grice actually had an idea that this, 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 our, this view was out there. I mean, he, here's a long quotation from the first page of the manuscript uh, or of, of one of the manuscripts. It says, in, the, in unpublished work, which may be familiar uh, to some of you, have tried to develop a view which may treat, which we may treat. Uh, I've got to get move the, the my uh, anyway. Uh, ordinary conditionals as material if we make use of a notion which I call conversational implicature, and I'll skip uh, down. Uh, in a closely parallel way, one might argue that one who says if P it follows that Q is conventionally uh, committed to no more than the necessity, than the necessary truth of the material conditional. And for me, it's not, maybe not, it won't be, uh, it might be a conventional implicature rather than a conversational one, but that doesn't matter. 
So that, but the, uh, the necessary truth of the material conditional, which in, in, in other words, a strict implication, and I think he means it in the, in the sense of S5, uh, but normally, though not invariably, conversationally implicates that he has grounds other than uh, the necessary falsehood of the antecedent or the necessary truth of the consequent. Okay, so um, he's rejecting, he says, well, look, the, there's an implicature that, um, uh, that, the, uh, that there is, there are grounds like an FCA Y schema uh, that uh, 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 could um, uh, explain the connection between these. Okay. On these lines, one might seek to defend the idea that follows from contains in its conventional uh, meaning no more than is contained in the meaning of yields. Okay. And then he says, well, I don't really want to do that. And maybe Jonathan Bennett has said some things like this. And, and he goes on like that. But uh, actually, Bennett's uh, uh, claims are quite vague and kind of open. But I think, uh, in fact, what he's uh, alluding to there is a better view than the one he comes up with. Uh, uh, and in fact, I think probably stands a chance of working rather than the one he has. Anyway, thanks very much. Uh, 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 that's what I... Hmm. Um, Thanks, Ed. <laughs> okay. Oh well, I didn't. I didn't go over length. Good. Uh, it, was, it was. It was about forty-five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um. Okay. So, any questions? Yeah. Okay. So, who, who fields them? Uh, I, I'm trying to, but I'm just okay. Uh, okay. Calvin, Calvin, you go first. I'm just trying to. So Ed, let let me ask you about that last, that last bit of crisis. I'm thinking about reductio ar arguments, uh, where where someone says, "Look at P; it follows the Q," uh, but of course not Q, uh, and therefore not P. Right? There it would seem uh, you're you you're not committing yourself to any um, to anything more than um, what you might call the. The, the classical conventional whatnot of the of uh, uh, am I right that, that yeah you, you I think you are right there and I think that that's what he needs and I I think um, uh, and what I forgot to say is that with the um, uh, with the the the, the um, that case of the distributed uh, 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 tautology as well that when we do K, uh, our, so uh, ex falso is one of them. Uh, I mean, sorry, not ex falso, but the uh, uh, reductio arguments are one of the, uh, are, are one sort of uh, uh, issue where um, you don't often don't have anything more than uh, just a Y schema. And I think that's why you need the Y schema and you have to admit that, so, this notion of entailment as um, uh, as a sort of a strict notion, this sort of we're going to just stick to doing the entailments, I think isn't going to work uh, because, or at least not to recapture very much mathematics. Um, and it's not just because the transitivity doesn't work, and it's not just because of the sneaky tautologies. It's because a lot of ordinary inferences don't work. And so that's one of them. The other one is um, this uh, one I alluded to. Uh, or, or mentioned um, there where you have this distribution and that is proof by cases, right? And you say, well, look, we've got a bunch of structures. Uh, um, and so let's consider the ones where uh, A holds. Okay, let's consider those. And then let's consider the ones where not A holds, right? And the assumption there is either not A or not A, right? Uh, and, uh, but then if you, if you find out that B holds in both of those sorts of sets of structures, then you, you, you get B out of it. But that's because um, what you've really proven is that A or not A entails B, right? And so it's not a contingent sort of thing. And, but it is a sort of, uh, um, 
And uh, why is it you can do that? Because you know that A are not A. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true, I think, with, uh, uh, with, with, with reductio, is that uh, if you show that um, uh, you end up with something impossible, then you know it's not true. Um, and uh, uh, and we, we, we can go through that, yeah. I'm, by the way, I'm playing Grice's uh, advocate here uh, in, in, in this talk and acting like a classical logician. I'm not one in real life, but uh, I'm gonna play that for today. I, I realized what I was saying was hyper-classical, so. Anyway. <laughs> Rod. What I find really interesting about this whole um, discussion is that it's in propositional logic. And that I find very puzzling because in the post Fregean age, we're no longer Stoics and we've got predicate logic, first order logic. And there doesn't seem to be anyone who's taken these difficulties with the conditional, taken them into predicate logic. Because while you're discussing um, transitivity, there would probably be very little disagreement that the Barbara syllogism translated into predicate logic is absolutely and completely valid. Yep. And there we've got um, transitivity of the conditional because it's each of the premises and the conclusion are universally quantified conditionals. So something seems to have happened when you promote the debate into predicate logic. Now, is anyone... I don't know of anyone who's really systematically done that and had a look at all of these in a fully predicate logic way. I mean, we've all got our examples, our favourite examples of something's gone wrong with the material conditional. But when you embed that into uh, predicate logic, for some reason, it all seems to vanish away. Well, not all, but a lot of it seems to vanish away. So I find it puzzling that of all the things that have to be picked on, as it were, and turned into a major issue of controversy, it's all being done at the propositional logic level. Yeah, isn't that weird? Um, and, and here's the, the, and one thing that's really strange about it is that uh, it's all done to um, uh, 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 to deal with uh, or, or treat uh, proof plans, especially in the deductive sciences, including you know, mathematics and um, uh, physics and things like that, they're not done in, 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 in propositional logic. You can't get very far in mathematics of propositional logic, can you? And you write about Barbara. So, and, and, and by the way, as another ad for my book, there is a chapter on quantification. Um, but uh, in order to, but there isn't anything good in that uh, on um, uh, restricted uh, the, that I've written because my I do work in, in, in relevant logic on um, I, I mentioned some things about uh, 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 restricted quantification but uh, I'm still not really happy with the the, the um, treatments there but that's a real problem because you know there are sort of two you're right uh, there's the 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 source of uh, modern um, uh, logic that comes you know from from the Stoics and is uh, about connectives and things like that, and uh, um, certainly mm. about con and, and the con conditionals, one of the major connectives that uh, the Stoics dealt with, but uh, the others, of course, from Aristotle and, and, and the syllogism, and we all think Barbara is valid. Uh, so what do you have to do? 
Well, you have to have something like a weaker conditional uh, uh, to treat uh, restricted quantification, you know, all A's or B's. And uh, once you put in the weaker conditional, you have to make sure it doesn't interfere with the stronger conditional, the entailment. That's easier said than done. And uh, in the sense that... Um, uh, um, if you suppose you want um, something Aristotle didn't particularly want, but uh, that a lot of modern logicians want to say, if there are, there are no P's, then uh, every P is a Q. Um, if you want something like that, then you might end up with uh, an entailment uh, from um, something like uh, there. Uh, there are no P's to uh, to all P's or Q's or or something like that. Uh, and relevant logicians start to get quite queasy with uh, uh, things like that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, where um, uh, conditionals are implied by non-conditionals and, and, and things like that. So... Um, so you, you, it, it can be quite tricky. I think I, I imagine there are better examples out there that uh, would be more um, uh, intuitively compelling. But, uh, the, the, but uh, to do that is, is rather tricky. And you would think after, um, so uh, C.I. Lewis published his first paper really on entailment in 1912. You think in the, in the last 120, uh, 104, uh, 112 years, we would have, said something about uh, entailment logics with uh, uh, quantifiers that's more um, more interesting and more uh, uh, more detailed than all of this. So I, I take your point, Rod. You're, 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 you're right about all of that. The interesting thing is that maybe it's, it emerges with the very long controversy about empty terms, you know, the um, conversion per accidents, mm. the controversy about that was um, hinged around whether the terms were empty or not. Um, so you get the existential viewpoint and the hypothetical viewpoint for the syllogism, mm. but the existential and hypothetical viewpoints reemerge in um, first order logic yeah and with the, so you've got something going on there but that seems to be repairable in a far easier way because as you know the solutions that have been proposed for propositional logic like relevant logic the predicate logics built onto those solutions are really a semantic nightmare. They're really extraordinarily complex in ways that are very puzzling. I mean, Kit finds semantics for quantified R are just mind boggling. Only yeah. Kit Fine could have invented that. No, uh, it's, 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 it's quite brilliant. Uh, but it's quite um, complicated and yeah. very touchy. If you want to lose a condition, uh, the whole thing crumbles on you. It's it's terrible mm. uh, in that respect, but it's so brilliantly interconnected. That, yeah. Yeah. As you say, only only the mind of a kit fine could produce that. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. You have, uh, it'll be interesting to read the section in your uh, book that's um, about some predicate logic issues. Yeah. I mean, I have different semantics for predicate uh, uh, logic uh, than Kit's. Um, uh, mm. uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah it's, uh, that I developed with Rob Goldblatt. Mm. Uh, also, it's it complicated. Oh. Not as complicated. Are you ready for the next question? Yeah, 
Tibor, yes, do you have yes, a question? Yes, sir, I am. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ed. And uh, greetings from uh, Bondi Beach across the ditch. Oh, great. Uh, uh, I have a two-part question. One is a bit of clarification, which I've looked for and I can't find a suitable definition. And the other one is a serious question. Uh, the clarification is, what's the difference between an entailment and an implication? Even on the slide that you're sharing at the moment, in the last sentence, it says an entailment implicates. And I find the two terms are, large, are used largely interchangeably. And I want to get some more mileage out of them. I want to try and distinguish between them and use them for different purposes because I've got two things in mind. The thing I have in mind is a way of describing, and I'm going to ask you how you do it because I don't think I'm right, um, a way of describing the Kantian transcendental kind of argument, which is a kind of implication or it's a kind of entailment. I don't know what it is, but it is here is my premise P, and therefore something must have been the case before in order to make me able to make proposition premise P. So that's a sort of transcendental argument. How, how do I, how do you, or how do I cope with that in 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 this idea of implications and and and, and entailments? Okay, so um, in the literature I was talking about, uh, from Lewis, C.I. Lewis to Grice, uh, implication and entailment tend to be used interchangeably, except that Grice talks about conversational implication. Uh, which he also calls implicature. Uh, and conversational implications are ones that are what are called cancelable. That um, So if uh, I start off a letter of reference by saying um, the person I'm writing so-and-so has very neat handwriting, if that's all I wrote, that would be considered to be a very weak, uh, that, that I, 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 I don't think very much of this candidate, right? Because that's not a very um, important thing to say, or at least it, it, it wouldn't normally be. But if you say uh, they have very weak handwriting and a very uh, nice handwriting plus, and then you go on to say a bunch of laudatory things, it takes away that implicature that I don't think well of the candidate. Uh, it, it, it might be just that I'm just a weird guy who thinks that handwriting is incredibly important, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's what's important. So for Grice, in, uh, in, uh, implication has, in fact, three meanings. Because when he he talks about material implication, he says material implication, which is the the truth table if then, which is much weaker than entailment. As a, it's not a modal connection, uh, and he does think that there's a sort of modal connection between premise and conclusion, even in um, uh, um, uh, in just ordinary uh, uh, arguments. The Kantian uh, issue is really hard. Um, so the problem is that uh, the precondition, um, uh, as they're stated uh, in Kant, so to get a, a, an an entailment out of them in anything that looked like um, a logical entailment would take a, a lot of uh, a ferreting out of tacit premises, I think. So if you take the, 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 the um, transcendental deduction uh, of the, uh, and you get a transcendental argument, one of, the, one of the arguments, or the argument, say, for causation uh, and uh, the link between uh, cause and uh, the um, uh, objective time series in, in Kant. To get that out, you'd have to, to just, a, a, as an entailment, you would have to add in just dozens of, um, uh, ta of uh, premises that are tacit in Kant. And maybe you can do it, uh, but I don't know. I mean, that would be an interesting but incredibly difficult exercise. Okay, so I'm not the only one who doesn't know how to do it. <laughs> I'm relieved because <laughs> I, I do find it difficult. Um, I try and restrict it or restrict my use of it um, to causal cases uh, because uh, if, for example, I sneezed, uh, then 
uh, by a transcendental argument, you could almost you, you could say that therefore I must be alive. I must have been alive in order to do that. Uh, so there's that kind of material implication prior to my sneezing. So it really is just a, a reverse inference of some sort, and and I, I can I can do that, and then I don't need to need, don't need to create dozens of prior premises, I just really need the one that I'm trying to talk about and say, well, I've just evidenced some prior circumstance for this to be possible because I've just done what I've done and, and I couldn't have done it without it. Mm -hmm. So but, so, um, how, how do I formalise just that aspect of the, the use of, of the transcendental attainment or something? Well, I, I think that, that what you would do there is... Um... So, um, the I uh, um, I mean, we can exhale uh, after we've expired. I gather, uh, you know, briefly after we've uh, you can release air. Once, from your body. Yeah, once. would it be considered a sneeze? And uh, that um, it might be part of the meaning of sneezing that. Uh, it requires a living being to do it. Um, a, a book or, or a table can sneeze, mm. uh, and not just because they don't have noses and things. It's just the the, the it's just a logical connection. Well, and they don't have they don't have the dynamics. Oh well, if if it's a physical thing, then you probably will need a lot of premises. Uh, if it is a real causal uh, argument, you might need that. I'm uh, in in talking about entailment as I have. I'm quite wary of talking about a connection between it and um, and, and causation, because uh, the the, the uh, or at least a necessary connection between it and causation, because a lot of the um, uh, in this, these proof plans you're trying to prove are mathematical statements, and there's no clear causal relationship between yeah, mathematical that's true. statements. No. Yeah, mathematics is different. You're quite right. Um, yeah, I, I'm just thinking more about when we're talking about the physical world, about real life experiences and so on, uh, mm -hmm. and not something in the abstract epistemic domain, which is where I place mathematics. Yeah. So what do we do with implication and uh, entailment in the physical domain, say outside the abstract logical So I think that there are um connections there so um uh there's um uh relationships that have to do with um uh, uh there are physical connections that underlie uh informational relationships and i think that those informational relationships that uh i uh, um i and i, I don't think entailment's the best way of thinking about them but it, a form of implication that's very closely related, uh, uh, it's relevant implication, is quite closely related in, in the sense that um, uh, I'm looking outside and I can see um, uh, uh, a, 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 a blue sky, and that will tell me that when I walk outside, I won't get wet uh, from rain falling from the, mm. the sky. And... Uh, uh, that sort of informational relationship, I think, can be described in terms of causal relationships and things like that. Okay. All right. I won't press the point. I'm sure other people have questions too. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Does anybody else have another question? Mm -hmm. I might just um, ask you a little bit more. Oh, I see. Calvin's um, got a question, but I just want, want you to just clarify one thing you said earlier, Ed, is that okay? Yep. Just when you were talking about the sneaky entailments where, you know, you've got the tautology, um, and then you said something like Grice didn't like it if the tautology was just distributed over the disjuncts, and you said, I think he's wrong about that. Yep. Um, I was kind of intrigued by that. I just wondered if you could say a bit more about about what why i mean did he think that it 
it wasn't um, kosher because, you know, you still have a tautology there just hidden a bit. Um, and But can you then say why you uh, thought he was wrong? Um, well, you kind of went wrong. very quickly there and I just thought, yeah. oh, that's interesting. <laughs> oh, I think he's wrong because of the particular case of um, uh, of uh, um, uh, proof by cases. As soon as you prove that a disjunction is uh, a tautology, then any thing that you you come across at least in classical reasoning uh, any structure you come across i mean in, in mathematics in particular but in anything it, uh if you prove in b or c then um uh then you can always split up your structures into those that have b and those that have c they might overlap but uh you can split them up and that's a, a very key piece of reasoning i mean um if you, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in, in mathematics, we use that all the time, as soon as you prove that there's this, uh, the, and so the sneaky tautologies are incredibly useful. Uh, and without them, I think, you know, he doesn't want to, uh, uh, he doesn't want, uh, Grice doesn't want to take the uh, relevant logic uh, uh, approach. He, he, has read, you know, Meyer's paper, but he's probably read uh, uh, Anderson and Belknap on relevant logic because they reject disjunctive syllogism. And that's an incredibly useful piece of reasoning too. But this is as well. And um, uh, um, uh, that, uh, you know, as soon as you, so I think that the, that some particular sneaky tautologies have to be allowed in, uh, because if you say, well, look, I've proven A, well, and I've also proven B or C, so that means that uh, let's put, uh, if I've got A, we know A for sure, then how about uh, the ones that were A and B are true? What what can we say about those? And the ones where A and C are true, can we uh, can we derive the same thing over there? And without that, that's it's very hard. I mean, we do that with um, uh, with bivalence all the time. You know, you, um, that you say, well, you know, uh, let's look at the ones where B is true. Let's look at the ones where not B is true, uh, and and and, and uh, yeah, try to do that derivation. Thanks. Uh, so Andrew, and then Calvin. Sure thing. Um, I'm sorry, I did miss the first part of your talk, and I will go back and and watch it. I was just a bit late, but I was worried about your proof by cases. I know if we got our classical hats on. Sure, fine. But it does seem to me, and I've had some mathematicians say um, something similar as well, when we have a proof by cases, the cases need to work differently for it to be a proof by cases. Mm. So you have P, um, B or C, and from each of those you derive the same thing, but by the same reasoning. It's kind of not a proof by cases in some sense, and something weird is happening. So if it is just a tautology and you're not using it, then something is wrong. So I'm thinking we use a proof by cases when the different cases work differently. I'm not sure whether that's a support of, of Grice's idea that you can't just distribute and go for it. Yeah, I, that, 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 um, but that's, so, so one reason to reject proof by cases is kind of a constructive reason, right? That if you have B or C, you, sh you should really know which one. And in, in any particular case, you should, know which one and then then your reasoning can be extremely different so if you know b is true then you can use all sorts of things about b uh that would make it true and uh uh and all sorts of different things about c that would make it true and uh so um in some ways i mean that the, the, the constructive mathematicians often say proof by cases is kind of irrelevant right it's it's or it, it, it you know they include it in, in, in um, uh, when they um, formalize uh, um, intuitionist logic, but they don't really think they ever use it, use it. It's not that important uh, for them. But if you want to, to do classical mathematics, I think you, you're gonna have a hard time not using it. And, but your one of your 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 points is that if you're doing if you're really doing the same sort of reasoning once you integrate 
uh, you know, once you, you look at the uh, A's and, 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 and B uh, camp and, and, and the, the, the uh, A and C camp of, 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 of uh, structures, if you're using the same sort of reasoning about them, then it really isn't sort of uh, proof by cases. What you're really doing is using the disjunction uh, right the way through or, or something like that. Um, that might be true uh, if it's the same sort of reasoning. It's just that the classical, in the classical case, you really aren't limited to that. So you take a look at a, 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 a um, and I don't have an example right at hand, but proofs by cases can also be sort of, oh, well, this, you know, some, some sort of case, trivial, obvious, next sort of case, 16 pages written on it. And so that doesn't seem to me that in the cla uh, classical reasoning, does really, uh, and standard mathematical reasoning does really require uh, an analysis uh, 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 of that sort of proviso that the same sort of reasoning has to take place. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I wish I had a good example of that, but that's my sense. And so uh, I'm just going to disagree with you, Andrew. Uh, uh, but um, well, I think I'm agreeing with you. But, you. but you might be right. I'm so, have time, in practice, we do do different cases. We have a trivial case and a 16-page case. And those are the cases where we're happy to do proof by cases. And those are the times that mathematicians use them. And those aren't the cases where they can simply reduce it to a tautology and do nice stuff. I mean, there's an extra layer when you can do distribution in terms of what people actually do. Whether mm -hmm. we build that into logic or social practices, I'm not sure. But I'm agreeing with everything you're saying, even if you're disagreeing with me. And I'm thinking yeah. that's making the point I wanted to make rather than maybe the one I did make. Yeah, okay. Okay, I, I think we're probably all, I'll have to think a bit more about uh, uh, about what I say about the sneaky tautologies. I think that there's, um, that maybe I was a bit glib about that, but I, I think that there's a lot more to say about that. I think maybe, and what you're saying is, I think probably that I have to get a little more specific about this and maybe maybe find some nice examples of it all. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the simple tautologies uh, put in there. And I think that just comes back to Rod's uh, uh, case that it, it, it's pro partly that we oversimplified the logic so much that uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the issues we're looking at are kind of a little bit too much toy examples. Calvin? Ed, can you just remind me of the role that assertion is playing in in the picture Rice is painting? And what I'm thinking, the background for is I'm thinking of Buridan, actually, who distinguishes the conditional from what he calls a consequentia, precisely because the, uh, the antecedent and the consequent of his consequentia are asserted. Uh, so, he, and people often might, I've done it, and others translate that as an entailment, right? Uh, yeah. Whereas the antecedent and the consequent of a conditional are not thereby assert, asserted. And I'm wondering, does Grace have anything to say about the role that assertion plays for him in entailment? No, um, uh, he he doesn't. And but that's a good point. If you um, a lot of people uh, when they uh, will say a therefore b, a lot of philosophers uh, 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 and logicians, well, a lot of philosophers, not so many logicians, but they'll mean there'll the, 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 be a, a, a clear um, implication that, uh, and, and, you know, implication is normally meant uh, that A is true. And so if A therefore B, B is true too. Uh, and uh, um, to use entailment in that way uh, might be sort of more reasonable, but I think everybody in this literature uh, wants to take um, uh, these things as conditionals in that weaker sense, and uh, that uh, uh, A uh, entails B uh, just means that if we had A, we'd get B, but do we have A? Don't know. Okay. So, uh, I, but it's certainly, I think, uh, in, in Christ, that would be, he certainly doesn't say that uh, we assume um, uh, uh, A uh, when we say A and tells me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Great talk too, thank you. Oh, thanks, Calvin, that means a lot. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah.
always clear, always interesting. You can put that on your resume, Ed. <laughs> Are there any more questions, anyone? Well, I think we should thank Ed for a great talk across the ditch. Yep. Thanks, Ed. Hope thank to see you, you too soon. I, I hope to see you too. I, I'd like to come to 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 Brizzy again. I used to like going there, and uh, yeah, uh, it's certainly a great place to go bird watching. So yeah, yeah. come out and hang hang out and see birds. Yeah, You're official. Be <laughs> You'd be most welcome. All the best. Thanks everybody for coming along. Thanks for inviting me. That, that was very fun. Thanks. Bye bye, everyone. Bye.